Well, Oregon hasn't had a 2025 recruit commit in quite a while. I think that's about to change. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks, which is why if you have not already, you should like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by our friends at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase plenty of football chat and another Oregon basketball transfer we'll break that down all coming up on uh, today's show but Oregon hasn't had a 2025 recruit commit in quite a while in fact the last 2025 news you probably heard was a decommitment well I fully expect Oregon to land Cooper Perry receiver out of uh, the Scottsdale Arizona area four-star wideout in the class Rashad samples is kind of one of the key factors there but I've heard from a couple of different sources that this is going to take place. I will be shocked if it doesn't. I I will be fully and completely shocked if Cooper Perry does not commit to the Ducks. And he is committing later today, 1 p.m. Arizona time. Arizona is sometimes in the mountain time zone and sometimes in the Pacific. I don't really understand how all of that really works. But I think that Perry is going to start the snowball rolling for for Oregon recruiting, building momentum in the 2025 class, because this show is airing on April 10th. That's 17 days away from the spring game, which is a big, big recruiting tool. You want to bring in visits. You want to get guys on either official or unofficial visits up for the spring game. You want to make it a big pitch. You want to showcase how many people, excuse me, how many people went or, you know, are at the game and what sort of environment it was and and everything like that. Like it's a big showcase for Oregon football and we're just over two weeks away from it. And I think that that kind of is going to be the mark of, of, you know, kind of the starter recruiting season of, of sorts, right? So I expect Cooper Perry to commit and I think that momentum is going to keep rolling along not just because of the spring game but because Rashad Samples is uh, Oregon's new running backs coach so I've talked about him a couple times on on the show this week I continue to just hear nothing but good things and read good things about him there was a piece from someone over at 24 7 sports talking about how Samples can you know really transform and further elevate Oregon's recruiting efforts in the state of Texas I'll have Brian Smith on uh, tomorrow's show to talk about, you know, what what his reputation is in the recruiting community. But the early the the early returns are that it's very, very strong and he's got big ties to to the Lone Star State. But samples is kind of the key uh, as to why I'm so confident that Cooper Perry is, is going to choose the Ducks, because his primary recruiter to Arizona State was Rashad Samples. And Oregon was already in the mix, and that that should you know be the final nail in the coffin for Perry uh, to choose the Ducks. And then I think momentum can start to pick up a little bit, building up to and following the spring game. And then you know Oregon's 2025 recruiting class, which is pretty light right now, is something that it, you know really gets built throughout. I think May, June, and July. If you look at the track record and the timeline of commits over the last couple of classes. It's really started to pick up in the summer months post spring game, which has been at the end of April the last couple of years. But Oregon's four commits in the 2025 cycle are Dallas Wilson, a wide receiver out of Tampa Bay Tech in uh, Florida, Achilles Smith Jr., of course, a um, a legacy recruit and just a big time quarterback prospect as well. Matthew Johnson, defensive lineman. Brian Smith likes what he sees from uh, Matthew Johnson out of De La Salle in California. And then uh, Chavez Thompson uh, is a big guy on the interior of the offensive line, six foot one, 310 pounds. So that's where Oregon's recruiting class currently stands, 29th nationally. It's really early to talk about rankings. I just you know want you to have an idea of where the class is at, but certainly when Perry commits, I expect that to get a bump. And then the ball, I think, will start to get rolling now that the staff is finalized. You got the spring game to bring uh, to build towards. And then the summer months are you know, really all about recruiting for, for Oregon football. Not entirely, but uh, primarily. So I think that that is going to get in gear. Let's shift to talk about Oregon's pass catchers because I think there is a 
reasonable argument to be made that Oregon's pass catchers are the best in the Big Ten. Notice I did not say wide receivers. I said pass catchers. That half includes running backs. I, I half include the running backs in that conversation. But I think that Jordan James and Noah Whittington have shown that they are plus receivers coming out of uh, the backfield. I think that you know Oregon's running backs over the last couple of years the biggest area where, where they've struggled ha has been in pass protection. But in terms of actually catching passes, making impact plays, you know, that uh, the, the one touchdown Jordan James had last year against Utah was a nice play. I really like the sideline throw against Washington in the Pac-12 title game. James ran a little out and up on linebacker and Bo Nix just layered it in between the backer who was in, uh, you know, trail technique and the safety coming over the top. I think that both he and Whittington, who was in, you know in an air raid offense at Western Kentucky prior to his arrival at Oregon, I think those are guys that Dylan Gabriel can confidently throw the ball to. But between Oregon's receivers and the tight ends they have, I, I, I think it's the best pass catch, catching unit in the Big Ten. And the, the number one competitor for that title would certainly be Ohio State. But you just don't have that many great offensive units. You don't have that many great quarterbacks, frankly in the Big Ten. There are some solid ones, but compared to what Oregon and, and what fans saw last year in the in the Pac-12, which was the best quarterback conference in all of college football, this is going to be a, a marked difference. This is going to be a, there's going to be a massive gap between the level of offensive play last year and what Oregon faces on a week-to-week -week basis this season. So, when you look at Oregon's top pass catchers, and I think that is going to look something like this. Evan Stewart, Tez Johnson, Terrence Ferguson, Treshawn Holden, those, those are probably your top four, complemented by guys like Gary Bryant Jr., Jurion Dickey, Patrick, Ferber, Patrick Herbert, and Kenyon Sadiq. That lineup, right, three tight ends and all those wideouts, it, it's, it's an embarrassment of riches. And, you know, when, when these guys speak at their media availabilities post-practice, they have been very confident in, in what they're capable of producing and you know what other guys look like and uh, I think it was Treshawn Holden was really gassing up Evan Stewart and what he brings to the table and what he can do at practice and how there's always just kind of you know an anticipation with him because a big play is just always waiting to happen I think that that's just applicable for for a lot of different Oregon weapons like they, they are just so talented so deep across the board you know Will Stein said about Terrence Ferguson he needs to get T-Ferg the ball more. He said of Kenyon Sadiq, who might be the third tight end for Oregon this year, my like sneaky hot take is that by the end of the season, Kenyon Sadiq is the number two tight end. But hey, maybe that's maybe that's too hot of a take and I'm disrespecting Patrick Herbert too much. It's not meant in that light, but that's of course how it'll come off to many people in the YouTube comment section. I think that Oregon going three deep at the tight end position is pretty unique. I think Oregon going confidently four deep and when you put in jury on dickey and or kyler casper five or six deep at the wide receiver position that that's just a that is a luxurious spot to be in that's living in a big old giant mansion compared to those who just have nice solid two-story houses in a good neighborhood now oregon's got the one that's standing out in in that particular block because when you go troy franklin to evan stewart that's not much of a drop off, if if any at all. Evan Stewart is an NFL capable guy, and then you bring back three players at the receiver position who you know are really good. You go three deep at tight end. You got pass catching running backs. I think that Oregon's pass catchers are are, are the best unit in the pack or in the. See what I did there? That's called a Freudian slip. I think they're the best pass catchers in the Big Ten collectively, and I've got more thoughts to share about them. Always got plenty of thoughts about FanDuel as well. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Both of those playoffs are uh, ongoing or upcoming. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. You can bet the Masters, too, which is this week. And let's just say I am a golf aficionado. I can't wait. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed that's 150 bucks whether you win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all in an app that's safe, secure, and easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Seriously, 
ask yourself, what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So before we dive into the mailbag here, a couple more thoughts on, on Oregon's pass catchers. I think that Will Stein could make that comment, which he made a couple weeks ago, you know, I need to get Terrence Ferguson the ball more, about multiple guys in this offense. I, I, I remember receiving a number of questions last year on the show about Treshawn Holden, and hey, is Oregon utilizing him enough? Is, is he really being, you know, uh, maximized? I feel like he's got more. Yeah, he does. He, he does. We watched him look like a number one caliber receiver on the outside, taking Troy Franklin's spot in, in the Fiesta Bowl against Liberty. And guess what? When you bring Evan Stewart in from Texas A&M, former five-star guy, and 24-7 sports still sees him as a five-star transfer coming to the Ducks, you you have Trayshawn Holden available to you, but he still probably won't be the number one guy. But that's just where they're at. And I think the fact that you know both Holden and Johnson decided to return and that neither one had, excuse me, has decided to transfer out it is indicative of that culture that I've talked about several times before here on the show of so many players decided to come back to Oregon this year because they know how special things can be. They know how good it can be, how good landing is, the opportunity to win in 2024 at a really high level. Remember, Oregon's a minus 210 favorite to make the college football playoff. It's one of the shortest playoff odds to make it in the entire country. It's even shorter than Ole Miss over in the SEC, who's brought in the number one transfer portal class, who's got Jackson Dart back at quarterback, who's got Lane Kiffin as their head coach. I really like Ole Miss. I've talked about him on Locked On College Football before, and I'm really, really high on the Rebels. And Oregon's got shorter odds to make the playoff because that's just where Oregon's at. I think their schedule, you know, works out pretty favorably as well. But the talent on the roster is just all there. And I, I think that Tez Johnson will lead the team in receptions again. Whether or not he leads the team in receiving yards, I think depends on Treshawn Holden. Notice I didn't say Evan Stewart. I said Treshawn Holden because last year, Bo Nix's favorite targets in order were, I think, Tez Johnson one, Troy Franklin two, and Terrence Ferguson three. Those were, those were his top three guys. Anytime you had a third down, Bo was going to one of those three. Well, this year for Dylan Gabriel, I think those options are in some order, but probably this one, Tez Johnson one, Evan Stewart two, and either T. Ferg or Treshawn Holden three, depending on the chemistry that those guys can, can develop. But when you have a big-bodied NFL caliber tight end with great hands who can make contested catches like Terrence Ferguson, I think Dylan Gabriel will learn to like a guy like that quite a bit. But the reason I say Treshawn Holden is the guy who will influence whether Tez Johnson leads the team in receiving yards this year is because I don't know which guy Dylan Gabriel is going to lean towards more on the outside. It's probably Evan Stewart. But will he look to Evan Stewart at the rate which Bo Nix looked to Troy Franklin? Or will he be a little bit more of a facilitator? Because remember back, those of you everydayers out there recall that Max Chadwick of Pro Football Focus came on here and said, yeah, Gabriel does a really nice job of facilitating the ball and acting like a point guard for an offense rather than just kind of you know, looking at, at a top couple of guys. Doesn't mean you're not going to have someone who who you look at first, but is Evan Stewart that guy? Is Treshawn Holden that guy? I think they both are are tremendously talented individuals. And, you know, this lineup of pass catchers, it's as good as Oregon has had. Like last year was very good. And this year, you'd have to say it's probably just as good. Could be even better. Could Tez Johnson be better? Could Treshawn Holden be even better? Maybe. Maybe. So I like Oregon's pass catchers. I think they're the best unit uh, in the Big Ten. Drop your thoughts in the YouTube comments below. As always, you can get in the mailbag there as well. Or you hit me up on X, formerly known as Twitter, at S. McLaughlin CFB or at Locked on Ducks. If you want priority access, go join the flock over at subtext. Link in the description below, wherever you listen to or watch this show. Question came in here from Alex. This is a fascinating one. Hey, Spencer, just listen to your Locked on College Football show. Amazing show. Appreciate it. I definitely recommend people listen to watch that show. I do too. It's a good time over there. In your recent episode, a recent episode, you mentioned how good of a team Georgia has and that they might even go undefeated into the playoffs. If the Ducks were to meet them in the playoffs, who do you think would win? 
Do you think the Ducks could have a chance at beating them, or is it too early to tell? Or if there's another team or teams you think will be in the playoffs that could ruin the Ducks' season, appreciate everything you do. Keep it up. Well, love the positivity, positivity, Alex, number one. Number two, Georgia should be the betting favorite and is the betting favorite to win the national championship over at FanDuel because Georgia is really good. <laughs> it's just, there, there, there is no other way to, to see the Bulldogs than they're very good. But I started thinking about this in the context of, well, Dan Lanning's first game didn't go the way we were hoping. 17 and a half point dogs, didn't even put a touchdown on the board, actually moved the ball, actually ran the ball in that game, couldn't finish in the red zone. Bo Nix was still getting haunted by the ghost of Kirby Smart, who then, you know, was, of course, alive and functioning as a head coach. He's, he's a very good one. On the other sideline, it didn't go well. 49-3, to three, which just goes to show you, don't judge a book by its cover. What if we'd all jump ship on Bo Nix and Dan Lanning? After one game, that, that wouldn't have been a very good take now, would it? So Oregon was outmatched in that game. Georgia's roster today, I think, is closer to what Georgia's roster was on that day than Oregon's when you compare it from now to day one, 2022. Now, do I still think Georgia has a better roster? Probably. Probably. I can't give you a player-by-player -player rundown of the Bulldogs, but I look at the way they recruit. I look at the way they bring in kids from the portal. I look at a guy like Carson Beck, a quarterback, who I think is really, really good. I, I think Carson Beck is absolutely fantastic at quarterback over there. But I also think Dylan Gabriel is really good. And I think that the Ducks have got a really good roster. But if Georgia's roster that season, remember they went unbeaten and won the national championship, and they routed TCU 65-7. to If that Georgia roster was a 10, the current Georgia roster is probably like a nine and a half. Whereas that Oregon roster was probably like a, a seven and a half, maybe an eight. And now I feel like Oregon's roster is more like an eight and a half, right? Or if you want to get into the Dave Portnoy pizza review calculation numbers, it's like an 8.8. .8. That's, that's, that's like a really, really good pie. So I, <laughs> no, those videos are hilarious, but not as nothing's as great as Miss Peaches. Can't, can't, can't mention Barstool now without Miss Peaches, obviously. So I think that Oregon's roster ha has dramatically improved. I think when you go back and look at guys who, you know, were on the field in, in that game and were contributing members for the Ducks, you just look at them and say, man, that's just not a high end, high, a high end sort of power four college football player. Like Trevin Mai was playing in that game and Jackson LaDuke was in that game and Seven McGee was in that game. I, I felt like Seven McGee still never really hit, hit his full potential. But you just had a lot of guys on there that ended up transferring out and not going to other power schools. And it, it was just a transition year, and it's where Oregon was at. But I think the recruiting and transfer portal acquisitions have been really, really strong to help Oregon close the gap. Have they closed it entirely? No. Because I think that when you look at what Georgia's done the last couple of years, Oregon's got a top five recruiting class in 2024. Well, Georgia's been stacking those up for the last several seasons, and they haven't had, you know, a coaching transition. They haven't had a mass exodus year from the portal. They retain a lot of their best players, and they add a lot of really good players every year as well. So if you want to keep closing that gap between Oregon and the very best rosters in college football, which right now is probably Georgia and yeah, Georgia's just above everybody. Else. I, I I think Georgia's just really, really good. And I know that's not a hot take. I, I, I know it's not a hot take. But if you want to keep closing that gap, you have to look at what Georgia's done and say, you know, they, they stack top five recruiting classes on top of one another. And if Oregon does that, you know, for the next three years and keeps bringing in transfer portal talent the way they have the last few seasons, then, yeah, that gap continues to narrow. And I think it has narrowed, but still there is more work that can be done. I think it's still too early to tell, you know, how just how good Georgia and Oregon will be. You know, the Ducks and the Bulldogs actually have the same win total, according to our friends at FanDuel, at 10.5. I think that's because Oregon's schedule is slightly easier than Georgia's, but I think it is a testament to where Oregon ha has gone under Dan Lanning, where they can continue to go. But also, you got to give credit to Kirby Smart and say they're, they're incredibly good incredibly good and worthy of
being the preseason national title favorites. Remember, they were one game against Nick Saban away from maybe winning the national championship for a third straight year. And they still ended the season 13-1. and one. That was the disappointing year for Georgia. But then again, Oregon went 12-2. and two. Came up short of uh, of expectations or or that team's full potential. So good question. Love the thought. I would love for Oregon men's basketball to get Tony Perkins. I'd also love for you to go check out Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. So they've got killer last minute deals. All in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Game Time uses all that to take the guesswork out of buying Major League Baseball tickets. If I were in a pinch and wanted to go to a Mariner game, I don't know why I'd want to go because they're terrible right now. But if I did, Game Time is the place where I would want to go because you can get deals right up to the start of the event, even after it starts, and you can save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, whatever you want, Game Time's got it. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-C-O-L-L-E-G-E for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. I don't want to say that Tony Perkins from Iowa is a carbon copy of Jermaine Kuznard, but Let's just say the similarities are startling. It reminds me of me and my brother, who once briefly made an appearance on this show when Jermaine Kuznard was the subject of conversation when he put up you know, a 40-piece in Oregon's win uh, against South Carolina in round one of the NCAA tournament. We're not the same person, my brother and I. We don't look identical. But when you put us side by side, we don't have zero things in common. We probably have more things in common than we don't have in common. So, Jermaine Kuznard is listed, according to the Oregon website, at six foot four, 211 pounds. He might even be bulkier than that with the muscle mass he has. That, that dude's got some shoulders. That dude, is, that dude is built. He is strong. Uh, Tony Perkins is listed on the Iowa website, 6'4", 205 pounds. See, there's six pounds of difference right there. Completely different physical makeup. Okay, okay. The year before, this is this is where it gets kind of eerie, okay? The year before Kuznar came to Oregon, he spent a couple of seasons at South Carolina. And that last year with the Gamecocks, he averaged 12 points a game, two and a half boards, three assists, Shot 32% from beyond the arc. Now, Perkins, this year, was actually more productive than that statistically. 14 points per game, 4.5 boards, and 4.5 assists, and he shot 30% from three. So, not identical, but very similar. He was also an All-Big Ten second-team selection this year. And there are other schools that are in the mix for Perkins. And so this is not going to be a slam dunk. You know, Oregon's got the grasp on him or anything like that. It's a name to watch for because he's got Oregon in the final six. There are other heavy hitters in there. But certainly, Oregon will be in the running. I did want to mention his stats last year, as in the 2022-23 season, in which Perkins... Definitely not Jermaine Kuznard. I'm just saying, I've never seen them in the same room together. No, I, I, they, they, they don't actually look alike. I'm just saying statistically, they very much do. The year prior with Iowa, Perkins, wait for it, 12 points a game, four rebounds, just under three assists, and 33% from beyond the arc. I'm going to go back to those Kuznar numbers the year before he came to Oregon. 12 points a game, two and a half boards, three assists, 32% from three. This is what Dana Altman's got to be seeing here. A guy that can shoot, but is not necessarily known as a shooter. He's got some size. He's got a physical element to his game. This is just something that Oregon has got to be able to find. You, you need someone that's got a little size. And, and can be productive at both ends of the floor. Now, admittedly, I can't say I've watched Tony Perkins play a live 
game of basketball because Iowa was not in the NCAA tournament this year. And by the way, the last time Oregon faced Iowa was in the NCAA tournament during the COVID year, won that game big time and went to the Sweet 16. But anyway, I digress. Perkins is a guy who brings an all-conference caliber pedigree. He was second team this year, can shoot a little bit. And I, I think the work that the Oregon coaching staff did with Jermaine Kuznard shooting from beyond the arc to the point where in the NCAA tournament this year, he was 11 of 22 from three in those games, really started to heat up. Now, he had his streaky moments. He had a, he, he was very streaky throughout the course of the year. He would, felt like he was either 7 of 11 or 1 for 9. And there wasn't always a lot of in-between with Kuznard hitting his threes. And I frequently came on the show and talked about how, you know, that was an important aspect of, you know, any particular game or matchup was Kuznard's ability to hit threes. But if you look at what Oregon's projected starting five would be right now, let's say Umar Balo from Arizona, who, again, is perfect. He's he's. He's so perfect. I, I have not seen or read anything with regards to who Balo is considering or what options he's looking at. Balo would be great. But anyway, let's say Balo does not arrive. Oregon finds bigs that are, you know, kind of backups, but you know, are, are not going to be all conference caliber players. And Nate Biddle's their starting five. If you have a starting five that featured Tony Perkins. Low 30s from from beyond the arc, which is fine, solid. Shoot the threes when you're open. But if you start 0 for 4, maybe try to look to get to the hoop. It's those sorts of guys. And you started Bam Tracy, Jackson Shellstad, KJ Evans, and Nate Biddle. You would have five shooters on the floor. And you would have some tremendous defensive prowess with both Evans and Nate Biddle in the middle. And this Perkins guy, look, I'm just making a proposition or a, a, a prediction, rather, prognostication, if you will, that if he's six foot four, Oregon wants him, and he played in the Big Ten, he probably plays a little bit of defense. That would be the question, because Kuznard was a defensive leader. When you watch those amazing cinematic recaps, which I'll, I'll touch on in just a sec. When you watch those throughout the year, who were the guys that were most vocal in the huddle? It's usually Jermaine Kuznard and Bam Tracy, right? Shellstad was a freshman. You know, Dante would chime in every now and then. But Kuznard was the emotional leader of this Oregon team, which made it all the more special that the Ducks went on the Pac-12 tournament run that they did and got to the NCAA tournament, won a game, and Kuznard's family was there, and it was all great. So that'd be one of the questions I'd have is, can Perkins be that sort of guy? Or does Shellstad need to step up and be that sort of guy? Or would KJ Evans be capable of serving in that sort of role? Would it be a collaborative effort? I don't know. But I know you need an alpha. You got to have an alpha. You got to have a dog, a Jermaine Kuznard, a Peyton Pritchard, a Dylan Brooks, somebody who everyone looks to, to be not just a leader on the court, but kind of in those off-court settings uh, as well during timeouts. I mentioned those Ducks versus them. Scott Anderson's work was a revelation this past year. I, I don't know how we survived without them. And they got so much attention and high, and they were amazing. And they provided insight and detail to Oregon's wins during the football season. They had them during the basketball season as well. They got nominated for, I believe it's an Emmy. That's fantastic stuff. Scott, if you're out there listening to or watching the show, that's so well-deserved because those videos were so phenomenally well done. I don't know a single person that watched those as an Oregon fan and didn't go, that was freaking awesome because it was it was it was always awesome it was always on point i love that they had them during basketball and the football ones were of course extra special because you know it's football and whatnot and there just aren't as many of those games but i look forward to having those back next year uh, as well oregon social team does a really really good job and hopefully that social team is going to be able soon to post about the guys that Dana Altman and company are bringing in. Because as a reminder, or for those who have not listened to a previous episode of the show, Oregon has just one high school commit after Victorious Miller, a shooting guard, decommitted. And when that move took place, my first thought was, who are they bringing in? Who are they bringing in 
that that kind of scared him off and made him go, this is no longer the right place for me. Now, maybe there was another factor at play. I, I haven't checked up on where Miller is going to commit, but I think getting Tony Perkins would make a lot of sense for why Miller would say, no, I want to go elsewhere. Because if he feels like he can come in and start day one, if you bring in someone like Tony Perkins, Perkins is going to start right away. Per- Perkins is going to be a plug and play starter and would be a really, really good fit. And as long as he brings it the defensive end, if if my, my dream starting five right now it, for, for, for next season is Jackson Shellstad, Tony Perkins, a rotation between Bam Tracy and Mookie Cook at small forward, KJ Evans, and Umar Balo. If that's Oregon starting five, that's a damn good team. But two of those guys not actually on the team right now, and we have to continue to wait and see. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and go Ducks.